top of the afternoon to you ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're outside the shop at the outside bench again. A few days ago we were checking out like the color situation, my choice of color essentially, why I prefer this versus a darker color. In the previous Faller's Corner video, we talked about getting it prepped, doing all that, the color. What we want to, well, what I want to talk about today is the axe handle choice itself. And so I'm going to have to be checking the view out uh, occasionally. Um, I've been known to spend uh, a fair amount of time digging through the axe handle selection in a saw shop. I'm extremely particular about what I'm looking for in the handle and we're going to talk about what I'm looking for and why. So obviously you're looking for straight. You can run your eye from the knob which is this part in the back here down the back or the belly. The belly in the back are these parts of the handle right here. You can check the thing for curve. Sometimes having a curved handle is actually kind of cool if it's got the right kind of curve for uh, uh, just wedging. I've had a few of them that just had a little curve to them and I didn't mind it at all. So if we want to talk about the grip back here, there's a certain thing I'm looking for. I don't have Sasquatch sized hands so I'm looking for a handle that back here in the grip area is a little bit smaller. Um, the throat of the handle is back here. There's a couple different terms, I guess. Throat of the handle, grip section. Um, but I like them to be a little more narrow. You can see it's actually got a little bit of a curve right in here on the top side. Um, that's just my personal preference. Um, if we look at the knob itself, this part right here is critical. Now, we can see the grains running in line with the back of the handle and the belly. The grain is running like this. If you get into a situation where the grain is running out perpendicular to the line of the belly or the back, that handle's not going to last. And now we're going to segue down to the local hardware store and take a look at some other um, ways that the handle is um, shaped and also some of the grain differentials. So the owners of the local hardware store were gracious enough to allow me to come into their store and kind of talk about some of the things that I look for in that handle on a personal level. If we want to take a look at the grain, this is called the knob, this part right here. The grip, however, is probably a little bit different in every handle shape-wise. Usually there's a little bit bigger of an end down here on the knob, but we can see that the grain is running kind of off a little bit depending on which way you have the handle oriented. This is kind of a round situation. If we want to take a look at an actual axe handle, this is called the grip part, throat of the handle, belly, back, belly of the handle. If we look at the knob we see that the grains running out kind of almost perpendicular to the line of the handle itself I personally don't buy a handle when the grain is oriented like this um, the other thing that I'm looking for on the back of the shaft is so the grains not really oriented like this as well how it's coming out I've had problems with axe handles like this cracking um, a lot of times I'll dig through the entire pile looking for a handle that has a good orientation of the grain. We see it's going off to the side here, but it has a nice grip area. So there's several things we're looking for in this process. If we look at 
the end that heads into the axe head itself. We see the grains running like this. You have to be careful putting your grady wedges in if they're the kind that are shaped like this. Especially if you run the grady wedges at an angle, it'll want to have a tendency to split this wood. I've seen where they fail prematurely that way. So as we inspect several different options, we're seeing the grains running out on this one. Like I said, I've dug through the whole pile at the saw shop before to find an axe handle. And we're getting a little bit better. It's running kind of close, but those are two of the things that I'm looking for in an axe handle that are pretty important to me for sure. Whoops. One of the other things I'm looking for is the shape back here with the grip and the size. I don't have super mondo big hands and so I'm looking for an axe handle that isn't so fat in diameter and has a good shape to it. They're a little thin, fit your hand very well. But again, searched the whole pile here and didn't really see one of these handles that had the grain oriented the way I like to see them on a personal level. All right, so we had an opportunity to go into it a little bit further. So just reviewing, I like my grain to run this way, and I don't like the grain coming out right back here in the shoulder piece. Um, I like them to be kind of like this handle right here, and it took me a while to find this handle. So kind of important. The other thing that's important is to cure your handle because they come green. You cure your handle, put it up in your shop up high in your house by your fire up on the mantle. Um, I've had situations in the summer where you know you need an axe handle in a hurry, well relative hurry. You can throw that thing up on the roof when the sun's baking down on it and I turn them every week rotisserie essentially. Um, I'll leave them up there for maybe a month and they'll be they'll be pretty cured at that point. Um, I've had this handle for more than a year. I will start looking around because I'm going to put this in ahead today and I'll find another one and I'll replace this one and have it hanging around and it could sit around for a year maybe two I don't even know depends on how things go. All right, so we kind of got that part of it dialed in. Um, I actually have a pretty interesting head. It's really narrow in the pole section. It's uh, hard on wedges if you have depth perception issues, which I do. Um, this is a four and a half pound. You can see right there, I kind of shine that up a little bit. Um, this is a GBA made in Sweden. The insignia is very small and hard to read. They kind of didn't have it angled in there just quite right. There's only a little small area down here. Um, I guess essentially if we talk about this, this is the cheek of the head itself. So in the cheek, uh, when they were putting the stamp in there, it was kind of tilted a little bit. It just caught the very bottom edge of the GBA. So there you go on that one. So if you look at the concept of Replacing an axe handle, my grandpa used to throw his heads in the fire and burn them out. I don't particularly like doing that. I like taking them out mechanically, so I'll use drill bits and I'll basically drill that situation, the old part of the head that's up in between the eye and the lug there, although this really doesn't have a lug necessarily. This is would be the lug area, but I like the round grady wedges versus the flat tapered ones because they basically apply pressure in 360 degrees. Um, I actually have a couple of them in this one right here, and I'll take and I'll be drilling that out. Um, is what I do on a personal level. And it takes a while to drill them out.
Now my grandpa's method of doing it in fire actually works pretty good in one respect. You're basically not having to worry about this part of the equation. So we're kind of just drilling maximum amount of holes in this thing. And drill from the top up by the eye. You can see we've actually made it through in a few areas. Now, if a guy was thinking straight, I don't know if that'd be me today. You can saw this off with the hacksaw easy enough and get it so you're able to get a little bit better flat surface. A lot of times when they're cracked, if I'm going to replace this one, for example, I'll just cut the thing off back by where the lug's located. And my drill gets walking pretty good. Here. But I think you're getting the picture. I'm basically like putting the hurt on the integrity of this handle in there just drilling it out now the other thing that I like that's kind of important in this is I got a little drift this was my grandfather's when he passed away my aunts gave me some of his hammers and tools so I'm pretty well pleased with that so eventually what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to get enough material out of here that you're going to be able to knock that head out of there into the axe the handle essentially so we'll see how good of a job this ended up being it's actually using a bar wrench too now this is a customized round grady wedge because I basically put it in the press and squeezed it down to work in that particular head since it's so narrow Now you can see, done a pretty good job. This thing, we're going to adjust it going the other way now. And we're going to use my custom old drift for this operation. And you can see 
you got it out. So there's the eye. Technically, if this had a little part cast in it right here, forged in it, whatever, it'd be of the lug. This is the lug area. So it's a four and a half pounder though. It's actually pretty sweet for chopping. Now, if we want to talk about axe head preparation, I have a tendency to lay the, this is the secondary bevel area. A lot of times they're pretty blunt. Um, I don't actually have a good example. I pulled some of these out of the boneyard. Um, this is actually an old craftsman head right here. But the secondary bevel a lot of times is pretty steep. And they do that because it's stronger. Um, there's less likely that you're going to have a problem if it's got more material out there. I kind of know what I'm doing with the chopping aspect. And to get through redwood bark, it's kind of spongy a lot of times. And so what I'll do is I'll lay this back a little bit so it's not so blunt. Coming this way, it's more, um, more narrow in here and this cheek part of the bit right here um so I'll lay it back into the, this is called the beard section right here and basically what that allows is for you to do um a little bit better job on the chopping from what I've found in a spongy bark situation so if we want to look at that for a minute um there's ways to do it I like this right angle grinder I have a uh, quote unquote throttle control on the back so I can spin it way up or sp like tone it way down and I run real aggressive floppy disk this is 24 grit I guess at a really slow rate of speed and I'll basically just go slow like this thinking that you can see that And I'll take the meat off with a serious flappy disc like that and I'll go from one side to the other and I'll usually work on one or two axe heads at a time because what's critical for me is I want this to be able to be handled with my fingers at any point in time without burning them. I don't want this material getting hot. so that's why I take my sweet time but you can see it changed a little bit back here in the secondary bevel we're taking that hump out of it a little bit and that's going to allow it to chop into spongy things a little bit better although this one's got a super nice shape out of the gate that was just for example I have some stro axes in the process and their secondary bevel is pretty blunt and so I've laid mine back quite a bit. This isn't a stro axe but you can see the secondary bevel is at least a half of an inch wide across that beard area right there. So again if you're going to work it you need to start out well from my perspective. Something pretty heavy duty grit. Take it off slow and easy graduate up to something like an 80 or 60 and smooth out because it'll have some pretty good gouges in it at that point and then in the end I'll finish it off with like a 120 and we end up with this situation where it's kind of like a mirror finish and you can cut your finger if you're not careful so I, I'm not really interested but you can see that I cut the end of my index finger right there I'm not interested in drawing blood I guess today so the next part of the equation is you want to verify this situation right here. Um, the wedge, the wooden wedge goes in that area and I usually take them off because I'm in these situations where this thing may be hiding out somewhere. I put them in a bag, save them out for later. So we're looking to see and make sure we got enough room to get that wedge down in there all the way. I've seen some of these this groove in here that they cut in. It's, it's kind of interesting and not very deep sometimes. So we're kind of looking at that part of the equation. What do you have for length? Um, 
if we take a look at getting it on essentially um, there's a couple ways to do that now again this axe head is really narrow compared to what you see on like a stro axe and this is a pretty narrow the head of the handle right here is pretty narrow and it's not actually gonna well, actually it will fit in there so that's pretty sweet I was thinking that to take some material off so a lot of times so what I'll do is I'll maybe take a little relief in this area right here so it's got a little bit of a bevel in there and it kind of allows that wood to kind of expand in there a little bit um, that's kind of just what I do let that wedge get down in there a little bit further so we could do that I guess What's going to happen is this part of the handle is going to be sticking up above generally anyway. It doesn't matter if it's gone, I guess, at that point. You don't have to really monkey with it. So fits on there a little bit nicer now. Um, I have this custom steel plate right here on the ground. I'm thinking that you can see that. And I have a 2x6, and I'll put the handle on there. You can see I have my ladder right there that I sit on, um, and I straddle it with my legs essentially. So what I do to get the head onto the handle itself is I'll take a hammer and beat on the end of the knob essentially. You wouldn't think that was the way it worked, but it does. It actually goes down on there. You can take your piece of wood. See now we're getting tight already in the front part of it and we're not anywhere close to having the head get up in there all the way. So now we have to take and think about this for a second and go, what if we need to start the process over? Again, like a stro or something, this will fit right in there. So you start looking at the color and you can see where it's rubbing. So you want to get rid of some of that material. I didn't mention one thing I didn't mention on a personal level is I like my axe head to be sitting down close to the shoulder because you have most of your strength right here in this process anyway and so this may take like some monkey business and we're inspecting down here to see what we have plenty of room still so we're going to continue the saga
and we're kind of getting down like again this is a really tall skinny head and so a lot of times by the you get down in here you have some of your axe head poking up out of there or excuse me axe handle poking up out of the eye already but we're just going to continue the saga I don't recommend doing this on concrete. A lot of times that stuff is kind of a little bit sticky because concrete's not exactly a smooth finish like a board. You can see we broke that one, um, but it'll actually pop. Especially if you have the wrong kind of grain in your hand, a little break the end of your handle off. So we're getting pretty close to sanitary now though. Got a pretty good fit in the top. Just for good measure. And you can see uh, the hammer actually put the hurt on it a little bit, which is nice. Still pulling paint, which means we didn't take too much off of the handle. But we're getting right down in that situation. Like I said, I like mine really close to the shoulder. That's pretty sanitary right there for sure. Dead blow hammer works nicely try to hit square on the end of the knob there and we're looking pretty good actually so we'll start with the wood wedge And you can see we put the hurt on the wedge. Went in there a pretty fair amount, which was nice. I'm gonna use the hacksaw now. I think I'm gonna use the vise and the hacksaw now. So we had a slight glitch in the filming operation because Thwartation is my middle name it seems like sometimes and I guess we're just going to take a look at what happened after I cut. I actually installed the round version of the Grady Wedge in my four and a half pound GBA axe head so we're all pretty much good to go at this point. What I thought we could do though I had this old beater that the kids have been using, pretty much hammered the cutting edge. Um, and I guess for the sake of demonstration, I can put a Grady wedge in this one, the round version anyway, show you how I do it. Um, and then we can continue the saga from there. So if we look over here a little bit, There we go. So essentially, I eradicated one of these. It was kind of an interesting story. When I first saw these, it was 15 years ago probably, and I actually called the company that made the axes and sold them. Well, sold them. I don't know if they make them were making them technically. And uh, the rep guy was actually pretty cool. He got me in touch with somebody a little bit higher up in the food chain and I ended up getting a half a dozen of these small, medium, and large ones. Uh, it wasn't on my charm and good looks by any stretch of imagination, but that guy was very gracious. He just kind of sent me a little bag of these. So um, I saved them technically when I'm doing axe head. So this one's thrashed, as you can see. We'll be replacing the handle here pretty soon but essentially what I did was I bought myself one of the 
just in case a guy was needing an extra chisel, one of the chisel holders, um, basically you tighten it up. If you want to get super aggressive, you can actually got about a 7 16 nut to hold it in place. But essentially what it has inside of it is an old beater half inch drive, half inch socket. And I use that to set the round grady wedge down in there. Um, actually works pretty slick and it's kind of a little bit of a process you kind of have to start the grady wedge gently and then you can get it in there hearing aid of course protection because I have to pull that back out of there anyway but essentially you can take the little chisel holder get it set up get it set right on top of that round grady wedge and you can drive it right down in there and end up with this kind of a situation here now once a guy gets it set if he does have a little bit of a problem I've noticed sometimes you can take and drill out the center just relieve the center a little bit And what that'll do is allow the wood that's on the inside that's having a hard time with the movement of the round grady wedge, it'll allow it to compress a little bit further and it'll actually kind of poke down in there. Um, you don't need to go very far because the, the round grady wedges are only about like that long. So, But anyway, that's what you can do on that. And once you get everything set down at elevation, if you need to, you can take and do a little cleanup with your right angle grinder. And kind of blend it in there nicely. So that's what I'm kind of doing on that situation. Now, since I had to start completely over in this process. I guess we have a little bit more time to look at some a situation. My kids have been using this for doing miscellaneous stuff. You can tell from the cutting edge. And again, gently working that secondary angle back. Takes a little bit of time, we'll watch that in. Now you can see I've been working on the toe of the cutting bit and I've been working on the heel of the cutting bit as well and you can see probably a little bit better that it's uh, been abused this is one of the I used to have to have about three sets of gear in my rig back in the day because you never know if you're going on special assignment so this is one of those old ones that I probably bought in some kind of a hurry and just had it for emergency purposes. Um, we'll just keep working on it, I guess.
120 grit flapper disc. Okay, now this is sharp enough to cut your finger at that point. I worked on this GBA a little bit. It's already, like I said, really narrow. Didn't want to like lay it back too much. And then if a guy wants to get super squirrely, you get out your file and I would put it in a vise. And I would take that last little bit off with a file and at that point you'd be able to shave with this thing which would be kind of nice especially if you're doing redwood bark yeah we're definitely sharpened right up now so this one was sitting around it got a little bit rusty but that's the way it goes sometimes this one my son was using it he wasn't chopping on well he was technically chopping on an apple tree actually but we got him stopped before it was down and out um but definitely you can you can cut I don't know if you can see it or not. So one of the other things that I thought about doing, oh, and a friendly reminder, never gets more warm than you can touch and hold on to. That's one of the criteria. And if you spend enough time, you'd, they'd be beautiful and perfect, but this is a work tool for me. Um, I like nice tools, but still end up having to use them in the end. So found this at a man sale for 250 we'll have to whip that and I didn't lay this back too far because this is going to end up being you can see the more uh this more steep this way off of this one I'm thinking that you can see that but this is going to end up being a kid's act so they have a tendency to pry on stuff a little bit more and again redwood bark um, this is how you want it. If you're chopping stuff that's super hard, maybe you don't want it like that. If you're doing a lot of prying, maybe you don't want it like that. Another interesting point, I'm not necessarily an axe aficionado. I wouldn't say that by any stretch of the imagination. If we look at the concept of a handle, this is going to be exaggerated just because if we look at the parts of the handle itself we have the knob over here we have the grip right here the throat of the handle is kind of an interesting concept because some axe handles come down and then they break and then there's the knob um, that part is technically the grip and the throat of the handle is this part right here. Um, the belly of the handle is this part right here. I'm hoping um, that nobody's going to grade me on my chicken scratch writing. Because it's not very good. Okay, belly of the handle. The Y is kind of lame, but you know how it, you know how to spell that one. Um, this is the back of the handle. And this is the shoulder. So there's a lot of parts for the axe handle 
itself. But it gets a little bit more interesting if we want to start talking about the actual axe head. I'm going to try to draw it somewhat realistically and it's going to be exaggerated so we can get a good idea what's going on. So the pull is in the back. The lug is this part right here. The eye is this part right here. The beard is this part right here. The heel of the bit is this part down here. The toe of the bit is this part up here. Now, obviously this is a head, axe head, and all encompassing. The cheek is this part down here. Um, the cutting surface is down here in the front, which that's an F. That's a C. That's the F. Okay. Chicken scratch. I already mentioned that, didn't I? Yeah. No points on penmanship, hopefully. No harsh grading either. So the cutting surface, obviously, is this thing in the front. Now, there's a couple of bevels associated with this process. We'll have to put this down for a minute and take a look at this little mini head here. So this one's, I'm hoping that you can see it's pretty thick. It goes down and then it drops in there. This one's pretty rusted up. I don't know if you can actually tell, but there's a slight bevel that's really narrow out on this cutting surface and then there's a secondary bevel Basically, if you look at it from the end, the cutting surface is running like this if the, if the axe is facing up and to the point. Now, out at the tip itself is a little bit of a bevel, and then there's like a secondary bevel, and then it kind of blends back if you look at it, the line of the axe, like we're looking at it endo like this maybe or like this it doesn't matter so there's a couple of bevels there's the initial bevel and then there's a secondary bevel and then it drops back into the main part toward the cheek now what we were watching with me and my right angle grinder was I was blending the primary bevel and the secondary bevel together so it's more of a seamless transition so when you're chopping it doesn't it, it's laid back like this a little bit and it actually they chop a little bit better um, redwood bark is really spongy that stuff if you don't have a razor sharp axe you can just be bouncing your axe off of that bark and so I like mine to be super sharp we'll look at that in a minute but so really close to the cutting surface is a primary bevel and then there's a secondary bevel that's back here in this area right here that's your secondary bevel we'll just do this I think everybody's picking up what I'm laying down Obviously, it's pretty exaggerated, and I've messed up my chicken scratch, if that's even humanly possible. I don't know how. So there's toe of the bit, heel of the bit, beard. There's a lot of parts associated with um, an axe head. So if we take a look at one in particular, I used to spend a little bit of time in trees years ago. Yeah, not so much. Now I like to take them from the ground, but... This is a similar axe head. It has a big lug down here. The eye is where the handle comes up through. Um, it's kind of an interesting concept. I bought this made up. This is 
A Husqvarna technically axe made in Sweden, made by hand, hand forged. But I hand picked this one out, dug through the pile. It took six months before I could actually find one that I wanted. And we can see that the grain's running in line with the back and the belly of the handle, which is what I like. Technically, we're talking about the grip back here. Here's the knob. Um, throat of the axe. This kind of a little nebulous right there. Belly back. Um, but, again, we see how most of the grain isn't, just a little bit of it's coming out back here on the shoulder. That was kind of important for me on this particular operation. So if we want to look at the GBA axe, because that's something that I'll use. Obviously it doesn't have a big lug, but you can see the beard and you can see how I've blended in that secondary and primary bevel so that the shape of this thing is more in line with the side of the cheek than it is going fat and then coming back. So it's laid back. That'll help you chop. Um, you're also going to have to be careful not to do a bunch of heavy duty prying though um, if you actually shape your axe head like this. So reviewing never got any hotter than a guy could stand touching with his fingers unaided with gloves and so that's critical. Um, at least in my humble opinion for dealing with it, we watched how you can get it razor sharp if you need it with the file after you've done all the blending. I used to spend a lot of time with brand new files working on these and a lot of times the final cut, I'm taking it like this actually. I'll get it kind of whipped into shape going the other way but the final cut I'm going as you would chop. And essentially, if you wanted to cut your finger with this, you could. So, we spent a lot of time going through the parts and pieces of everything. Talked about some of the names of the pieces, the parts, the players, if you will, of the equation of an axe. Um, I never counted up what the total is, but it's a pretty impressive number. And we saw why, well... We didn't, I guess I explained my concept of why I pick handles out of the box and spend a long time. We look at this really old one, you can still see the grain is going this way. So it's critical if you want longevity in your axe handle to have that grain set up in the handle the right way. All right, so long session, follow up off of the paint operation where we were taking a look at why I run a certain color on my handle. Now we know why and how I do my axe head and add actual handle choice, which is probably one of the most critical parts of the whole equation as far as I'm concerned. So thanks for watching this session. Have a blessed day wherever you might be on God's green earth.